Good morning. My name is Carsten Tilger. I'm the Global Head of Corporate Communications and Public Affairs for Henkel. And together with our Head of Investor Relations, Lars Corinth, I would like to welcome you to our joint investor, analyst, and media webcast. Before I hand over to Lars, let me outline briefly our agenda for this morning. We have distributed today two news releases, one relating to our financial results for 2019 and our outlook for 2020, the other one relating to our new strategic framework. In addition, we have published our annual report and sustainability report online on Henkel.com. After this brief intro, Carsten Knobel, Chief Executive Officer for Henkel, and Marco Swoboda, Chief Financial Officer for Henkel, will present to you our financial results, our outlook, and strategic framework and ambitions for the future. This will be then followed by a Q&A session. Now let me hand over to you, Lars. Thank you, Carsten. A good morning and warm welcome to everyone joining us via the webcast also from my side. Thank you very much for your interest in Henkel. I would like to remind you on our disclaimer regarding forward-looking statements you can see on the chart. As always, we will not read it aloud. But please note that today's presentation and discussion are conducted subject to this disclaimer. And with this, let me hand over to Carsten Knobel. Carsten, stage is yours. Last Carsten, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm excited to open this year's Investor and Media Conference. Unfortunately, we were not able to hold our conference in London due to the recent developments of the coronavirus, but it is also our responsibility to help preventing and controlling it. Thanks for joining us uh, via the webcast. Let me start by introducing Marco, our new CFO. Marco joined our management board at the beginning of the year. He's a highly esteemed colleague and has been an important change driver for our company. So Marco, warm welcome. I feel honored and privileged to lead Henkel together with our management team into the next chapter of our rich history. It's now 25 years ago that I started in this company, leading in many roles and functions. I feel proud to be a part of a company with such a strong tradition, a unique set of values and a committed team of more than 50,000 people across the world. To me, Henkel feels like home. I have led through many ups and downs, through tough times and times of great success. And it is clear to me, I'm taking the helm of Henkel at an inflection point. I'm fully convinced of the potential of our great company, yet it is clear that we cannot continue driving performance as we have in recent years. We need a new game plan. In my first 60 days as CEO, I spend a lot of time listening, listening to customers and consumers, listening to business partners and employees, and listening to investors and shareholders, including many of you. And here is what I've heard. I've heard acknowledgement of our strengths. Yes, we are a financial healthy company with a strong balance sheet generating more than 3 billion euros of profit. Yes. We have high quality brands, innovations and technologies holding leading market positions across the world with long standing customer relationships. And yes, we have a strong track record in sustainability. And finally, we have a loyal, passionate and highly committed teams around the world. At the same time, I hear a strong voice of skepticism. I hear concerns about our performance slowing down in the last two to three years even to the point of three profit warnings last year. I hear criticism of top management sugarcoating results in the past. I hear doubts whether we are agile and dynamic enough to turn the corner. And I hear questions whether I am the right person for leading Henkel's transformation. And I took this at heart. Over the past decade, I have been part of the management team during the performance acceleration as well as the recent slowdown. Yes, the business context was challenging. And yes, in hindsight, we made mistakes. As Henkel feels like my home, I am deeply passionate to put our company back on a track towards purposeful growth. 
Purposeful growth goes far beyond financials. To me, this is about truly exciting our customers and consumers, inspiring and growing our people, having positive impact on our society and the planet, and ultimately outperforming the market. Now, the context is tough for all of us. We have great assets. What ultimately will make the difference is having the right strategy, the right team, and the right culture. With passionate, dedicated people around the world, we will put Henkel back on a purposeful growth track. I strongly believe that the personal commitment is vital to drive change. So here are my three commitments that I believe are critical to transform Henkel. Transparency. We will take an unbiased, factual look at our performance and progress, and we will share this transparently to regain trust. Ownership of our results. We will deliver and take full ownership, meaning explanations yes, excuses no. I stand for pace, and I will enable the entire organization to speed up. And third, driving real change. Driving our performance in a more sustainable way and evolving our culture mindfully to support the change journey. It is a mindset shift for Henkel and a team effort. Therefore, I'd like to set today's scene with a new level of transparency and our aspiration for new momentum in mind. So, what to expect from today? First, I will start with a brief overview of our results 2019. I will then hand over to Marco, who will provide more specifics and background on 19, and will finish with our Outlook 2020. After this, I will share with you the Henkel Group review, giving you the perspective of the management team regarding both our foundations and the areas of change. That leads to our future direction, where Marco and I will elaborate on our purposeful growth agenda. We will then open up for questions and close with a brief summary. 2019 wasn't an easy year for us, and we delivered a mixed performance. Overall, we fell short on expectations. First, we did not grow organically. Second, our EBIT margin, as well as our earnings per share, were at the lower end of our expectations. Nevertheless, we managed successfully to build on our strong foundation. We grew nominally to more than 20 billion euros and we generated a strong 3.2 billion euros of profit. We achieved a high uh, free cash flow, all time high, and despite our mixed results, we propose a stable dividend of 1 euro 85 cents per preferred share. Throughout 19, we faced an environment with both significant headwinds and some tailwinds. On the other hand, our industrial business was affected by a slowdown in key uh, sectors such as automotive. The expected recovery in industrial re demand did not materialize. The consumer markets we play in, on the other hand, showed a good growth dynamics, yet being very competitive. And it is fair to say that we didn't leverage the full po market potential in 19. Again, our business was impacted by geopolitical tensions across the globe. However, we benefited from currency tailwinds and the lower increase of direct material prices throughout the year. With this in mind, let's give more color into our 2019 performance. Marco, handing over to you. Thank you, Carsten. So good uh, morning to everyone also from my side and thank you very much, Carsten, for the kind introduction. I'm excited to have the opportunity to present to you today and I look very much forward to meet you and speak to you in person in the future. On to our 19 financials now, starting with our top-line development. Organic sales development was flat, which is for sure not what we had expected in the beginning of 2019, as Carsten also elaborated. Volume was negative at minus 1.8%, mainly due to weaker development in adhesive technologies as well as in beauty care. This was compensated by positive pricing in the same magnitude, thanks to our efforts in our industrial business, but also strongly supported by laundry and home care. 
The net effect of our acquisitions and divestments had a positive impact on sales of 0.5%. Currencies were also slightly positive, with plus 0.6%. We had support from a stronger US dollar, while some emerging market currencies had a counteracting impact. As a result, Hengel recorded an increase of 1.1% in nominal sales, totaling 20.1 billion euros. Moving on now to the organic sales performance by region. Overall, mature markets were negative, with minus 1.6% in organic sales growth. And while our businesses in emerging markets increased organically by 2.5%, this is far below the levels we achieved historically. Let us dig a bit deeper now. As you can see, both Western Europe and North America were below prior year. To a large extent, this was due to negative organic sales development in our adhesive technologies business due to the weakness in industrial demand, which even accelerated in the second half. Beauty care also recorded a negative performance. And laundry and home care was flat, respectively negative in Western Europe and North America. However, in both consumer businesses, we saw an improving trend over the second half of the year. The performance in emerging markets was heavily impacted by Asia-Pacific, which recorded a negative organic sales growth of minus 6.5%. This is particularly due to weaker volumes of adhesive technologies, mainly in China. Here the negative trend eased over the course of the year, partly due to easier comparables. Asia-Pacific was to a smaller extent also impacted by the destocking in our Chinese beauty retail business. On the other hand, we achieved double-digit organic sales growth in the Middle East Africa region, which is of high importance, especially for laundry and home care. And in Eastern Europe, we recorded very strong growth. And while pricing was a key driver, also volumes grew very strongly in both regions. Let's have a look at the performance of our business units, starting with adhesive technologies. The business unit posted an OSG of minus 1.5%. As a result of the weak industrial demand, volumes were down by 3.3%. We have been securing positive pricing throughout the year, and it remained positive also in the fourth quarter, but on a lower level. By business area, we face significant headwinds in transport and metal, and electronics, which both experienced declining organic sales. A key drag was a continued weakness of global light vehicle production, which declined by close to 6% in the full year, with declines across all regions. General industry also came in below prior year. The business area was affected by destocking in its distribution channels, which was due to lower demand. In contrast, consumer, craftsmen, and building achieved positive organic sales growth. The rather non-cyclical packaging and consumer goods business was flat. Let's now also have a look at the other financial KPIs of adhesive technologies. Thanks to the continued implementation of price increases and cost efficiency measures, combined with the neutral direct materials impact, we were able to increase our gross margin. Nevertheless, the adjusted EBIT margin came in 60 basis points lower year-on-year, closing the year at a competitive level of 18.1%. This was mainly due to the impact from lower sales as well as mixed effects. Networking capital in percent of sales improved slightly. Summing up, I believe it is fair to say that adhesive technologies delivered a robust performance in a very challenging environment, a result of our strong and well-balanced portfolio and business model. Beauty care. Beauty Care recorded an organic sales development of minus 2.1%, a performance clearly below our expectations and our ambition. Both pricing and volume were negative. The development was driven by the performance of our beauty retail business, which was significantly impacted by the destocking in the Chinese retail distribution channels. Adjusted for this effect, organic sales growth of total Beauty Care would have been slightly positive in the full year. Market shares of beauty retail were slightly down in Western Europe. The market was characterized by low growth dynamics and intense price pressure. North America remains slightly negative in terms of organic sales in the full year. 
However, thanks to successful innovation initiatives, we return to growth in the third and the fourth quarter. In hair coloration and styling, beauty care continued to increase market shares globally, driven by strong product launches. Hair Professional achieved another year with strong growth. Both our base business as well as the brands we acquired in the past few years contributed to this development. The adjusted EBIT margin of beauty care came in at 13.4%, 370 basis points below the previous year level. This was to a large extent due to negative sales growth as well as regional mix effects. In addition, direct material prices continued to be a headwind which could not be compensated with pricing. As a result, beauty care recorded a declining gross margin. Increased marketing investments into our innovation and growth initiatives also lowered the EBIT margin. Networking capital and percent of sales improved strongly to a level of 1.9%. 280 base points lower compared to year in 2018. Good development, largely driven by the Chinese retail business. Over to laundry and home care. The business unit achieved an overall strong organic sales growth of 3.7%, predominantly driven by pricing, while volume growth was also positive. From a category point of view, laundry care recorded good organic sales growth. During the year, the fourth quarter was by far the strongest quarter in terms of organic sales performance. This was to a large extent due to our mega brand Persil, which had an extraordinary year with double digit organic sales growth. Home care achieved very strong organic sales growth thanks to successful product launches and rollouts in toilet care and hand dishwashing. Our business in the largest laundry market, North America, continued to be an attention point. Sales remained below the prior year due to negative volumes and declining market shares. Organic sales growth in our Western European business was flat, while the emerging markets grew double digit, equally driven by price and volume gains. Laundry and home care recorded an adjusted EBIT margin of 16.5%, 160 basis points below prior year. Our gross margin was stable, here, positive pricing, as well as our continued focus on cost management, compensated for the persisting headwinds from higher direct material prices. The main driver behind the decline in the margin were the high investments in marketing, supporting the continued launch and rollout of important innovations. Networking capital in percent of sales improved by 140 basis points to a level of minus 5.3%, a strong performance. Let us move back to the Henkel Group, taking a closer look at adjusted income statement. Henkel achieved an adjusted EBIT margin of 16%, minus 160 basis points versus prior year. Group adjusted gross margin at 46.3% was almost flat compared to the prior year. Key driver of the decline in the adjusted EBIT margin was hence an increase in marketing, selling and distribution channels, expenses, both in absolute and relative terms. In percent of sales, they increased by 130 basis points to a level of 23.9%. This was to a large extent due to high growth investments. Let's have a closer look at these growth investments. Beginning of 2019, we announced a plan to step up growth investments in our brands, technologies, innovation, digitalization by 300 million euros per annum. Until the end of the year, we have realized about 50% of the planned step-up. Let me give you a couple of examples of the initiatives we supported with these investments. In laundry and home care, we achieved double-digit growth with our premium mega brand Persil in 2019. Strong results with our caps and liquid innovations contributed to this performance especially our unique four-chamber, four-in-one discs, showed a very good performance in Europe and North America. Our core brand Bref generated high single-digit organic sales growth through successful innovations and premiumization in toilet care with Bref Deluxe and Sandswitch launches. Here we are achieving higher average price points 
with positive effects on profitability and new records in market shares in many countries. Beautycare strongly supported innovations under our millennial brand got to be and in coloration resulting in strong share gains. Due to the further rollout of NatureBox, our Nature brands achieved organic sales growth in the high double digits. And in hair professional growth was strongly supported by the launches of the high-tech coloration Egora Vibrance and new premium brands. One of the main projects in digital was a further rollout of our adhesive technologies eShop. Meanwhile, we are generating close to 2 billion euros in sales via this platform. So why didn't we spend the full 300 million in 2019 already? Firstly, key initiatives started step by step only from the end of the first quarter. We have not been able to catch up this backlog in the remainder of the year. Secondly, we also had to compensate for unexpected developments. For example, in our Chinese beauty retail business and the continued deterioration of industrial demand, which, other than expected, did not recover in the second half of the year. Let's take a closer look down the PL. Adjusted EBIT totaled 3.2 billion euros, a decrease of minus 7.9% compared to the prior year figure. The financial result amounted to minus 88 million euros in the reporting year versus minus 65 million euros in fiscal 2018. The decrease mainly due to interest expenses from lease commitments of 16 million euros following the first time application of IFRS 16. Adjusted taxes on income amounted to minus 760 million euro. This corresponds to an adjusted tax rate of 24.3%, an increase by 0.8 percentage points year on year. As a result, adjusted net income after minorities amounted to 2.4 billion euros. This translates into adjusted earnings per preferred share of 543 euros, down 9.7% year over year, or at constant exchange rates, minus 10.1%. Let's look at working capital, free cash flow, and the net financial position. On group level, the ratio of net working capital to sales reached 3.9%, an improvement of 120 basis points compared to year-end 2018. We recorded a free cash flow of 2.5 billion euros, a strong increase of about 550 million euros compared to the previous year. While this result underlines our strong cash generation capabilities, the increase was to a large extent due to an extraordinary reduction in networking capital. Resulting from the slow growth and improvement measures, for example, in our China beauty retail business. Adjusted for those effects, free cash flow would have been close to 2 billion euros, still a compelling number. As a result of our strong cash flow, our net financial position improved by 850 million euros, ending the year at minus 2 billion euros. In 2019, we spent a total of 662 million euros on CapEx. At 3.3% of net sales, the CapEx ratio was on a healthy level. Around two-thirds of these expenditures were channeled into expansion projects, innovations, and streamlining measures. One key project is the construction of our adhesive technologies innovation center at the headquarters here in Düsseldorf, which we expect to open end of this year. In laundry and home care, for example, we expanded our innovative detergent capsule production in the US and Hungary. In addition, we spent almost 600 million euros on acquisitions, adding around 125 million euros of annual sales. Now, closing the review 2019 with dividends. Despite the decline in net earnings, we kept our dividend proposal for the AGM in April, stable at a high level of 185 euros per preferred share, almost twice the payout, whereas eight years ago, the payout ratio increased year over year by 3.3 percentage points to 34.2%. Let me conclude with the guidance for 2020. We expect expect a continuously challenging market environment that is difficult to predict, particularly with regard 
to industrial demand. In the consumer goods markets, good growth continues to be mainly driven by emerging markets. The competitive intensity and ongoing price and promotion pressure, especially in key mature markets, are expected to persist. At the same time, we are stepping up our growth investments in advertising, digital and IT to 350 million euros in 2020 compared to the base year 2018. This equals a year-over-year increase of about 200 million euros. The translation of sales in foreign currencies is expected to have a negative effect in the low to mid-single digit percentage range. And prices for direct materials are expected to increase by a low single digit percentage compared to the previous year. Taking all this into account, we expect group organic sales growth to reach 0 to 2% and an adjusted EBIT margin of around 15%. Compared to prior year, we expect a decrease in adjusted earnings per preferred share at constant exchange rates in the mid to high single digit percentage range. Clearly, there are additional pressures and uncertainties related to the COVID-19 outbreak. Let me briefly comment on this. We are monitoring the development very closely. Our first priority is the health of our employees and their families, and we have taken respective measures. Let me take the opportunity to sincerely thank all our teams for their support. While all our sites are operational, Challenges do exist, especially in logistics and customer demand, both in the industrial and consumer businesses. Because of this, we expect significant impacts from the coronavirus outbreak on our financial performance in the first quarter of 2020. Based on our current assumptions, we estimate the negative impact on our first quarter sales to amount to circa 100 million euros. Please note is a very rough number. The situation overall is highly uncertain and unpredictable. And we ask for your understanding that we cannot be more precise at this point in time. The final number can be higher, but also can be lower than the 100 million euros I just mentioned. With this, back to Carsten. Thanks, Marco. In summary, we faced a difficult year 19, ending up below our expectations. But despite the challenging business environment and some operational setbacks, we have started to step up investments in our brands, technologies, innovations, and digitalization, and we generated a strong cash flow improvement and a significant improvement of our financial position. Our dividend payment for 19 will be stable on a high level, and after careful consideration, we expect 2020 to be another transition year, with the coronavirus adding an element of uncertainty and unpredictability. As I mentioned in my introduction, we believe we are at an inflection point. We are convinced, yet we need to open up new avenues for growth and performance. In the spirit of transparency, I'd like to share the outcomes of a group review we conducted as a management board. I'll start with our foundation, provide our perspective on our financial performance, and I will end with an overview of the key areas of change we see. We are proud to have strong, long-standing customer relationships and high-quality brands, innovations, and technologies across all business units. We are a global leader in adhesive technologies, two and a half times bigger than the number two, a clear worldwide number two, three with laundry and home care, and globally positioned as a number three with our beauty care professional business. Our dedicated, passionate and loyal teams drive impressive initiatives across the globe. All 52,000 people are committed sustainability ambassadors to anchor sustainability in everything we do. The execution power of our global shared service center landscape is second to none driving efficiency through automation and artificial intelligence in seven shared service centers across the world. M&A has been an important driver of our growth agenda for decades. We spent more than 12 billion and we integrated 73 deals in the period between 2008 and 2019. Our strong foundation 
is a great opportunity and an obligation at the same time. An obligation to leverage it and to safeguard our long-term success. So why do we believe we need a new growth agenda? Let's deep dive into the fundamental analysis of Henkel's long-term performance over the last decade, including where we stand today. We come from a period of strong long-term sales growth driven by all three business units. However, as I highlighted at the beginning of the presentation, our current approach to drive performance is no longer sustainable. Instead of continuing our long-term growth story, we experienced a slowdown recently. We evaluated mainly three underlying causes. First, we suffered from execution setbacks, especially in our consumer businesses in the US and in China. Our consumer businesses missed growth opportunities due to a lack of impactful innovations, especially true for our beauty care business on the one hand, and we underinvested in brands on the other hand. Finally, our industrial business was exposed to the challenging industrial environment over the last 15 months, especially in the segments of automotive and electronics, also here at the cost of growth. The results are not satisfying and a clear call for action. Despite our long-term profitability improvement, we had to face a notable decline recently. Over the years, we improved our margin over the long term thanks to a combined combination of strong cost management, mixed effects and efficiency gains. Our gross margin at that point did not contribute to this development. Our recent profitability, however, declined. So what are the drivers behind? We suffered from margin pressure, our gross margin decreased by roughly 80 basis points. At the same time, we decided to step up our growth investments because just driving efficiency is not a sustainable long-term solution. And declining volumes also left their marks as well. Despite some difficulties, we managed to continuously improve our balance sheet and our strong cash position in the long and the short term, which is indeed an excellent result, especially based on our efficient networking capital management, which is also a clear door opener. With our cash generating capabilities and our low debt levels, we have the optionality and we are committed to reinvest in growth and performance. Our conclusion is that our approach to performance is not sustainable. And therefore, we have identified new avenues to drive performance and growth. In the following, I will take a step back to understand the key areas for change and the must-win battles to reunite growth. Let's start outside in. I'm not telling you anything new now when I say that we live in a volatile, unpredictable and a challenging world. I already illustrated some of the environmental headwinds we face. But every challenge comes also with an opportunity. Growth of emerging markets, new digital business models, diverse customer requirements and collaboration as a new imperative, new ways to innovate and excite our consumers to, know, to name only just a few. And there is a new era when it comes to sustainability, a key competitive advantage in the future and a topic every single one of us is responsible for. None of these opportunities are completely new for us, but we need to accelerate. Let's look at our businesses in that context. Beauty care. True beauty with the key competitors in hair. As an industry, beauty is one of the biggest FMCG markets in absolute terms and a very attractive growth market. Our strong professional business and our powerhouse in hair and our deep category expertise build a really strong foundation. Schwarzkopf, our iconic brand, creates 2 billion of euros of a turnover in a year. Yet, our beauty care portfolio is currently not lined up good enough against the industry growth opportunities. It includes too many diluting subscale brands. And we're even losing market shares in some of our key categories. To unlock our full potential in beauty, we finally have to fundamentally review our portfolio, act on underperforming brands, invest more in innovation and marketing, and find ways, new ways to drive growth. Be it online, 
we are new data-based business models, or we are advanced analytics. Laundry and home care. Creating clean living based on an impressive research and development expertise. Thanks to our trusted brands and strong innovations, we are the global number three with more than 70 number one positions in an attractive growth market. For generations, our consumers trust in our brands like Persil, and we are winning in a very attractive segments like the heavy duty detergents, but also in terms of like toilet care. Yet, we have not delivered on our aspiration to win in North America. And to close, some white spots in the emerging markets. And also here, we have created a long tail of subscale brands. We did not support our strong brands sufficiently, and we see the results of inconsistent marketing investments. Despite our strong innovation pipeline, we don't leverage our full potential yet. And adhesives technology. Driving high impact solutions in adhesives, in sealants and functional coatings worldwide. We have a very robust and balanced portfolio second to none. We excite our customers with innovative high impact solutions and we own the broadest technology footprint in our industry. Yet, also here, we have to adapt to capture new opportunities in new technologies and in adjacent businesses. We have a clear strategy to transform the business into that leverages growth trends such as mobility, connectivity and sustainability. And especially on sustainability. We have only begun to fully size our opportunities. Sustainability. Sustainability is not just a core value. It's a part of our DNA. For more than 140 years, we have been taking a visionary approach to supporting an environmental and social progress. We recognize the potential impact we can have by developing sustainable innovations because our products and technologies are used millions of times around the world every day. For example, we've integrated environmental and social criteria into our innovation process so that every new product or formulation we launch contributes to sustainability. However, despite our great initiatives, we did not catch the momentum to position sustainability as a competitive edge. Despite our expertise, our sustainable approaches are not fully tangible for our consumers yet and for that to be a real differentiator. Digitalization. We clearly see a big potential in digital. We have a good foundation. We can build on our ERP harmonization. We have a state-of-the-art shared service uh, organization, as I mentioned before, and we have strong progress made in industry 4.0 activities. However, our digital function is not lined up to be a real strategic differentiator yet. We have to transform here further. We must leverage our data and analytics capability to opening up new growth opportunities. We have to drive a holistic approach with adequate digital in-house expertise to respond to new market realities and we have to seek new digital business models. Finally, we have to increase efficiency to manage the digital cost trap. We cannot create impactful, impactful change without engaged people. While we have a strong foundation with our loyal and committed people at the core and our new leadership commitments launched last year, we see a clear need for change. We need to accelerate our cultural journey to foster collaboration, empowerment and to strengthen the sense of belonging. We have to create a culture for entrepreneurial minds and start with our leaders who must live up to our leadership commitments. Change is key to win the war for talents, increase diversity and meet the fast changing expectations of tomorrow's workforce. The need for change is crystal clear. Our approach to drive growth and performance has been over-relying on efficiency and cost reductions in the recent years. We must build on our strong foundation and revive our unique DNA. And 
we have to start prioritizing and acting on our areas for change to open up the new avenues for growth and performance. And we have to carefully design a new growth agenda in thoughtful steps. This is our aspiration. To win the 20s through purposeful growth. Purposeful growth means that we commit to growth, to a growth aspiration that goes well beyond financials, which in all transparency has been our primary focus in the recent years. We aspire to outgrow our markets through superior customer and consumer value. We aspire to differentiate ourselves through positive impact on the planet as a leader in sustainability and to develop our people and give them a sense of belonging. This is a bold aspiration which we feel very excited about. And at the same time, this aspiration reflects our commitment to continue Henkel's long-term success as a family-owned company in a sustainable way. To win the 20s, we have to tackle six strategic focus topics. First, we will rigorously optimize and shape our portfolio. Our aspiration is very clear. A winning portfolio with a particular focus on optimizing our consumer businesses. Second, we will accelerate with impactful innovations to shape the markets with increased investments we strive for a competitive edge. Third, we will double down on sustainability and turn it into a true competitive differentiator. Fourth, we will transform digital into a customer and consumer value creator. And fifth, we will reshape our operating models to be lean, fast, simple in every single operation across the company. And six, we really believe culture is not an enabler. It's the ultimate competitive advantage. It starts with leaders who make others grow. We have structured these six strategic priorities into our strategic framework, which will reshape how we drive performance and deliver on, on our aspiration on purposeful growth, both in the short and in the long term. This framework is an important frame and of course the pillars and the strategy behind will evolve over time. But we want to provide you a bit more color on each of the six imperatives in terms of their aspiration, what will be different, as well as the early steps we have taken. Rigorously shaping a winning portfolio implies shifting from protecting what we have to playing to win. This requires a very different aspiration and rigor, both in terms of divestments as well as M&A, to build a winning portfolio across all business units. So, Marco. We will deep dive into the first steps towards a winning portfolio. Please. Thanks, Carsten. We see three key levers to shape a winning portfolio, and in the following, I will elaborate on them. Active portfolio management. Active portfolio management has a strong track record of impact in adhesives for more than eight years. Now we want to have, have a specific focus also on the brands and categories in our consumer businesses. We have taken criteria like market attractiveness, ability to win, organic sales growth, gross margin into account in order to analyze the portfolio and have categorized our portfolio measures into areas of turnaround, continue, divestment and exit. And we have reviewed our consumer portfolio in detail. Based on this approach, we have reviewed our consumer portfolio. And based on that first analysis, we have identified, identified so far more than 1 billion euros of sales volume, predominantly in consumer. This equals more than 10% of our consumer portfolio and an even higher number in our beauty care business. Around 50% of the identified sales volume is marked 
for divestment or discontinuation by the end of 2021. But portfolio management alone will not be enough to create a winning portfolio. That's why we see high-impact M&A as an integral part of our portfolio strategy. Let's not forget that we have invested 12.5 billion euros in M&A since 2008, 100% of which was through our strong cash flow and financed by debt. Thanks to our strong free cash flow generation, we could deliver the company typically over a short period of time. We subsequently integrated around 70 deals successfully. We utilize our strong balance sheet to pursue high-impact acquisitions, for example, to expand technology leadership in adhesives or build winning positions in our consumer businesses. With that, I hand over to Carsten. So, thank you, Marco. <coughs> we can only achieve our growth ambition if we enhance our competitive edge. Innovation, digitalization, and sustainability are our three must-win battles. Let's first understand how we can accelerate innovation into a true competitive differentiator. We will accelerate impactful innovations, shifting from playing to save to shaping the market. This will require acceleration of new innovation approaches, both impactful and focused innovation pipelines, and increased investments in order to turn innovation into a competitive edge. Turning innovation into a true competitive edge will require us to renew our approach with significantly better consumer and customer insights, to move decision-making closer to the market and to intensify co-creation, open uh, innovations and also idea crowdsourcing. We will scale our agile approaches and invest in incubators and innovation centers. Our new Adhesives Technology Center inno Innovation Center is a first example and will be completed by the end of this year. None of this is new to Henkel and we have great pockets of excellence. But the reality is that we need to significantly step up scaling these innovation models and approaches. And we will. Let me spend a couple of minutes on the topic of innovation. Innovation was a strong driver of our performance in the past and will be key for our success in the future. Therefore, I'd like to share some exciting examples from our innovation pipeline. Accelerating innovation will be a bolder impact with bolder impactful innovations to shape categories instead of driving only incremental innovations. We will shape our innovation strategy further in the coming months. In adhesives technologies, we are a front runner in innovative solutions, leveraging the mega trends I mentioned before with mobility, connectivity, and sustainability. We aspire to accelerate the automotive industry, industry transformation. The value of Henkel solutions in future cars will more than double versus the value in a conventional car. We build on our broad technology know-how to develop innovative and high-impact solutions that really will shape the car of the future. Our adhesives expert will further drive applications emerging from the megatrend of connectivity. Internet of Things and mobile communication drive double-digit growth rates of 5G devices. We are well positioned as material solution provider for the connected future. We co-create innovations with our customers to provide high-impact solutions, for example, used in the 5G mobile devices antennas and the 5G base stations. In beauty care, we aspire to grow our hair powerhouse with impactful innovations. We revolutionize the hair salon business by stepping into leading edge hair and IoT science. We just started to offer our customers and consumers a unique experience. Our smart salon lab hair analyzer enables us to support consumers in a complete journey from salon to home. In the salon, the hair structure is scanned which delivers insights for, custo for customized solutions. 
We used these insights to develop in-salon and take-home solutions. The fiber clinics customized hair repair. It's Schwarzkopf, professional, is most advanced in repair technology. An impactful innovation that shows how we will sustain our strong growth momentum in professional and we will continue to build on that. But we also capture future trends with innovations like our Nature Box shampoo bars. It is a great example of how we capture trends, here the strongly growing nature trend. We aspire to address new target groups with a Nature Box clear sustainability proposition. Launched, and launched at the end of last year, the product already became the best-selling SKU in Nature Box brand's hair portfolio above the liquids. Just four weeks on shelf, Nature Box Shampoo Bar became the number one solid shampoo manufacturer's brand in Germany. So going forward, we will further premiumize our hair portfolio by building on the strong proposition of Nature Box. In laundry and home care, we leverage our iconic brands to win in fast-growing segments. Let me share two lighthouse examples that illustrate how we accelerate innovations through advanced technologies. In the US, we are currently launching Persil ProClean 4-in-1 disc and Liquids Plus Oxy, combining the innovative 4-in-1 disc with a unique and boosted enzyme mix significantly improving the performance. Oxy is amongst the fastest growing segments in the US with double digit growth rates. We are very excited about this impactful launch. Another laundry care innovation are our Persil 4-in-1 uh, Malador discs. They come with a new patented odor neutralization technology. Malador control is a highly relevant consumer benefit. The rollout is planned for Europe and North America in this year to leverage the potential of the strategic caps segment. We will further leverage state-of-the-art technologies to improve our value proposition on that. We also have a strong innovation pipeline in home care, focusing again on improved performance and enhanced consumer benefits. Preel 5 Plus is the new high-performing dishwashing detergent with a self-degreasing technology that works up, five, up to five times faster in, the, in lifting the grease thanks to an innovative surfactant system. The rollout of the Preel Power and Pearl series is a compelling example of how we continuously improve meeting consumer needs with impactful innovations. The mineral pearls are made of a new sustainability technology using 99% natural origin ingredients without compromising performance. However, reality is that we need to accelerate on such market shaping innovations and cut the tail off incremental projects. An important driver of our new innovation strategy is to consistently support our innovations and our brands with targeted investments in core categories and regions. We have compromised in recent years on innovation support and we started to turn the corner in 2019. And we are committed to further step up growth investments in advertising, in digital and in IT. Compared to the base year 2018, we will increase growth investments by 350 million euros to drive impactful innovations supported with sharp communication of brand purpose to radiate our aspiration. Compared to 2019, this represents a further increase of 200 million euros. Third, we will boost and double down on sustainability as a competitive edge. Over the years, we built an amazing foundation to build on what we have highlighted, what I've highlighted before. Our social engagement, engagement, for instance, our corporate citizenship has always been an integral part of our sense of responsibility as a company. But we need to shift from being the silent, modest, best student hiding his, behind his report card to claim the space, to raise the bar, and to monetize the assets for Henkel. While we are working with the determination to deliver on the targets we defined for 2020, we are today stepping up our goals for the future with new milestones to actively contribute to climate protection, to circular economy, and social progress. 
we aspire to anchor sustainability in all we do. Therefore, we raise the bar and we are committed to becoming a climate positive company by 2040. And we strive to accelerate our, our sustainability mission towards 2025. We target to reduce the carbon footprint of our production by 65% by continuously improving energy efficiency and by using electricity from renewable sources. In addition, we want to leverage our brands and technologies to help customers, consumers and suppliers to save 100 million tons of CO2 also until 2025. We can build on great progress and activities in sustainable packaging. However, we want to go a step further and even being more ambitious with targets until 2025. We will promote circular economy by using 100% recyclable or reusable plastic packaging, second by reducing the amount of virgin plastics from fossil sources in our consumer products by 50%, and third, helping to prevent waste from being disposed in the environment zero plastic waste into nature. As a multinational company, we have a role model function. We decided to raise the bar to further enhance our positive social impact. By 2025, we aim at 100% responsible sourcing. We maintain intense and maintain an intense dialogue with our suppliers to promote sustainable practices and to respect for human rights along our value chain. We have also completed our Sustainability Ambassador Program. After having trained more than 50,000 Henkel employees, now it's time to kick off the Sustainability Ambassador Program 2.0. And we just started to plan a next wave of initiatives. We support social engagement activities of our employees across the world to improve the lives of 20 million people. Let's go into the business. We want to firmly anchor sustainability in all our activities. We will leverage our deep understanding of key sustainability trends as a central pillar in our innovation strategies. And we will strengthen the sustainability positioning and the purpose of our brands. With our Rethink Fashion campaign, for example, Perwall is motivating people to rethink their fashion consumption. At the same time, our Perwall Renew detergent helps that closes last longer. A fantastic example of a purposeful brand. Packaging also plays a key role in making our commitment to sustainability to make sustainability tangible. We are moving to packaging made of 100% recycled plastic with up to 50% social plastic or even zero plastic packaging solutions. In our adhesives business, the circular economy is a key priority. We will leverage the potential of our products and technologies, enable breakthrough industry solutions and set industry st uh, standards. Let's give you one example. Together with key players from e-commerce, we have developed a fully recyclable mailer to replace bubble wrap mailers. Finally, to grow and evolve at the same time today's business world, we must digitally transform in both new and incremental ways. We will transform digital into a customer and consumer value creator. Here, we need to catch up to some extent and shift from digital as a function to digital as an integral business driver. And to this end, we are completely overhauling our digital setup. Our key priorities to leverage digital, to boost revenue streams, to drive end-to-end -end uh, customer-centric digitalization in industrial, to generate new business, and to continuously drive efficiency and speed. We can only outgrow the markets if we boost one-to-one -one engagement and digital sales in consumer. First, we have to scale up our IoT projects and step up direct-to-consumer channels. We acquired a majority stake in a personalized hair color D2C platform called eSalon, which gives us great insights on portfolio and media. Only one of potential digital use cases. Second, in the light of rapidly changing consumer needs and demands, engagement is key. 
Schwarzkopf CRM allows us to engage with our consumers, build relationship and provide tailored content and hair solutions. Through consumer data, we are gaining deep insights, which we will translate into the most productive innovations. And finally, the importance of digital sales growth increased drastically, not just as of today. We started here to step up unique e-innovations and recent, recently launched a pilot with our Persil power bars sold via online marketplace. A dedicated agility team launched the super compact product with a new plastic free packaging solution in less than six months from idea to shelf. End to end customer centric digitalization industrial will further enhance our customer value creation strategy. We aspire to digitize our customer experience across all touch points. We started the rollout of a fully integrated CRM with a new user-friendly web presence in more than 50 countries and launched data-driven marketplaces for specific verticals. For instance, the maintenance, repair and overhaul business that resonated extremely well. We will further pursue our end-to-end -end data integration. This will enable us, for instance, to create artificial intelligence-driven innovative and especially customized solutions and significantly strengthen our competitive advantage. And finally, we will invest in digital talent, especially data scientists and engineers with future capabilities and deep technological industry expertise. As mentioned, we are completely overhauling our digital setup as we speak. We are setting up a future unit called digital business which will allow us to deliver on our strategic aspirations. To stay laser focused in the execution of our growth agenda, we have established a new CDIO position at the end of the last year, which will now combine the digital and the IT teams across Henkel and they will directly report to me. The new unit digital business is built on two pillars. First, business technology, our vehicle to drive efficiency across our value chain through continuously optimizing our business processes and IT systems. Second, Henkel Digital, our new dedicated unit for market-oriented oriented incubation and innovation, leveraging the digital ecosystem. We will accelerate through hubs in Berlin, Silicon Valley and Asia, digital innovation hotspots with the access to digital talent pools. Digital will be a strategic core competence with strengthened internal capabilities in software, in data, and in analytics. Dedicated efforts into new business building ideas for additional revenue streams. A digital ecosystem with strategic partnerships on top. Digital business will be a key lever to create value for Henkel. We are also reshaping our operating models to be lean, fast, simple, future-ready organizations. We aspire to intensify our efforts to enable new business models, to step up customer and consumer proximity with faster decision-making mechanisms, and to continuously increase efficiency and realize important savings. Marco. Thanks, Carsten. For purposeful growth, we need to intensify our efforts to step up customer and consumer proximity with faster decision-making mechanisms and to continuously increase efficiency by constantly reshaping our operating models. We are already implementing operating model changes across our businesses that are delivering first impact. Let me illustrate these, but bear in mind that this is an ongoing effort. In adhesive technologies, we decided in 2012, to further verticalize our business, to focus on most attractive customers and markets. Since then, we are consistently executing an active portfolio management. From the former 26 steering units, we now moved to 11 strategic business units organized in four divisions. These are aligned with megatrends, like Carsten pointed out earlier, especially mobility connectivity, and sustainability. The new 11 strategic business units 
have an end-to-end responsibility that enables fast customer responsiveness. At the same time, it will allow us to drive synergies and competitive advantage through scale and know-how across our portfolio. From 2020 onwards, we will report adhesive technologies as one segment within our group segment reporting and will comment on the development of the four divisions. Let's move on to beauty care. In beauty care, we launched our transformation program designed to support our growth ambition. First, we empower the front line. We implement new regional structures, increasing focus on must-win strongholds and key growth markets. We rebalance our global versus regional organizations for faster decision-making and to better serve our customers and consumers. Second, we design and develop the anti site more in the region for the region. Marketing, R&D, supply organizations are reorganized to mirror the regional clustering and new product development shifted from global level to regional strategic market units. Third, we will invest in growth capabilities via a new growth office, a dedicated growth unit to identify buckets of future growth across customers, consumers, and channels. And fourth, we increase organizational agility by streamlined structures and reduce complexity. Also for our laundry and home care business, we are stepping up customer proximity and increasing efficiency. We drive enhanced regional focus for more synergies and empowerment of our front line. The focus is on the following three. High growth regions, Europe and North America. Further, we have a new digital and game changer unit in place, focusing on future growth fields. And finally, new process and agile methods for more agility and customer and consumer proximity will enhance our innovation power. This includes project management methods such as Scrum, cooperation, co-creation with external partners, and fast trend detection and testing. With this, back to you, Carsten. Good, Marco. Thank you. <clears throat> so, finally, our aspiration of a collaborative culture and empowered people are at the heart of our strategic framework and will be a key enabler of purposeful growth. Without our people, we cannot win the 20s. Thus, it is imperative to accelerate our cultural journey, putting our leadership commitments at the center of everything what we do. We will strengthen a culture of empowerment and collaboration to enable our people to drive new ways of performance and growth. We will develop them and create a sense of belonging for our employees and attract top talents. We believe that leadership is everyone's business. Therefore, we decided to introduce our four leadership commitments at the beginning of 2019 that articulate our high expectation when it comes to leadership, agility and collaboration. What's new is that our leadership commitments are the guiding principle for everybody at Henkel. Everybody in the company, not just our leaders, is responsible to define how we work together and therefore must be committed to act as entrepreneurs, collaborate as strong teams, develop people with passion and own our results. We will be measured against our behavior and are asked to active, actively shape our culture by bringing them to life. Our people are key. We are in the middle of designing and launching a comprehensive multi-year cultural transformation starting at the top, starting with me and my management team. We decided to start with a new level of transparency and we decided on the first very important step. We want to engage with more than 10,000 people, employees in a cultural health survey to create a baseline on our culture. You have heard about many new performance and growth drivers, new business model, agile innovation, database uh, service proposition, new customer and consumer insight generation, open source partnerships, cultural change. To enable all these, 
we will need to significantly invest in upscaling our workforce. To this end, we have already launched a cloud-based learning platform, digital upskilling initiatives, and started to step up our digital workforce transformation. Every day, since 25 years, I am impressed and I am inspired by the diversity of our employees, their backgrounds, experiences, their talents, their knowledge, and their creativity. Henkel is a place for those who stand up. And we will continuously build on new opportunities to collaborate, to stay curious, to rule the change, and to make a difference. Looking at our six strategic pillars, our new strategic framework, I am convinced that we have found the right answers for purposeful growth. We will outgrow the markets. Creating a winning portfolio, regaining competitive edge through impactful innovation, sustainability and digitalization with future-ready future ready operating models, with mindful leaders, empowered people and a collaborative culture. We already identified a first set of key actions along the strategic framework. Let me summarize them. First, we will shape our portfolio. We have more than a billion of sales. 50% of that is marked for divest or exit by end of 2021. Second, we will step up the investments in 2020 by 350 million more versus 2018 to succeed with impactful innovations. Third, we will reduce CO2 by 65% and move to 100% recyclable and reusable plastics by 2025, and we will immediately start. Fourth, we will implement our new digital business setup starting in 2020. We will complete the execution of our operating models in all our businesses within this year. And we will finalize the rollout of our leadership commitments we began last year. We will execute this distinct set of actions to regain momentum and credibility, but only as a first step. At the same time, we will use the next month to underpin our aspiration with further actions to shape our midterm performance. Our journey continues. We will accelerate our initiatives, further evolve our growth agenda, and continue the open dialogue with our customers, consumers, our employees, and with you. Therefore, I am convinced that we will achieve our organic sales growth target of 2 to 4 percent, aspiring even the higher end of our corridor. That we will deliver mid to high single digit adjusted EPS growth at constant currencies. And that we will continue successfully generating and utilizing cash combined with pursuing compelling growth opportunities while maintaining the cost discipline which is a muscle we have trained very well over the last decade with clear and real results. Also going forward, I would like to continue improving the way we interact and communicate with the capital market. From today onwards, it is our amb ambition to foster a more open and transparent communication and increase the face time to me as CEO. Aspects which have been criticized by investors, we have been talking to. And I hear you. We used the new momentum and decided to focus on top-line developments in our first and third quarter reporting from now on. That means more focus on organic sales growth, a crucial KPI for capital markets to measure our performance. At the same time, we will ensure that we provide a deep understanding of quarterly top-line drivers. And as you are well aware of that, this is in line with the approaches used by most of our European peers. This step will help us to foster a more long-term and a less short-term orientation to focus on the topics that matter most, both in our businesses and in capital market communication. Of course, we will continue the detailed presentation of full-year results in the more meaningful six months and full-year periods. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like now to open up for the Q&A. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Knobel. Ladies and gentlemen, the question and answer session will be conducted electronically. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you change your mind about asking a question, please press star 2 on your touchtone keypad. We will take questions in the order received, and we will take as many questions as time permits. Please limit your questions to a maximum of two questions at a time. Thank you. Our first question comes from the line of Christian Fight. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. I hope um, everybody can hear me. There's lots of background noise, though. Hello? Excuse me, we can can't you? hear you currently. Can you hear me now? Hello? 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 Yes? Now it's better. Uh, Try oh. it again. All right. Uh, Hi, Christian here. Sorry. Um, I hope you can hear me. There's a lot of background noise on, um, in, the, in the line. Anyway, two questions, please. Um, I know this is difficult to judge, but aside from Corona, so leaving Corona aside, how would you assess the current demand situation in adhesives and key customer industries, uh, obviously predominantly uh, automotive and uh, electro-electronics? And then, uh, second question, can you please elucidate measures that led to an improved working capital at the end of the year and uh, obviously also in Q4? And how sustainable are those measures uh, going forward looking at free cash flow? Thank you. Christian, the, the second question of networking capital we clearly got, but can you do me a favor and repeat uh, what you said uh, to the first question because you were not really, uh, we could not really understand you completely. Okay, I'll try my very best. I'm almost uh, in the mic um, at the moment. So I know this is a difficult to touch, but aside from Corona, how would you assess the current demand situation in adhesives in key customer industries? Yeah. Marco, you take it? Yeah. So um, what we assumed in our, um, in our outlook for 2020 was that we have a very gradual improvement of uh, key markets over the course of 2020. So quarter by quarter, we assumed an improvement in line with the forecast we had for industrial markets. For the uh, year as a whole, we assumed an IPX development of plus 1%. Uh, but as I said, starting from a lower level and then gradually moving up. And we have to now wait and see how that will further be updated uh, once the corona impact is more clear. But that is basically the assumption of forecast. Networking capital. So the second uh, networking capital improvement uh, question was uh, whether how much that is uh, sustainable or not, uh, what the measures were. Um, we have uh, improved by a couple of efficiency improvement measures and uh, we have made improvement uh, as I elaborated uh, in the business unit section for example in the beauty retail China business where we could really drive efficiencies by all the measures we have implemented and also we have seen improvement especially in the US in our consumer business and uh, from that point of view um, it is my expectation that that level is sustainable that is not a one time uh, development that we have seen. Mm -hmm. Christian, to build on that, I think we have, re uh, I have been reporting on that uh, over the last, I would say, four to six quarters and uh, also here. We have implemented measures in all the three business divisions in order to improve and we are getting the fruits and nothing uh, more than to comment what Marco said. What we did is sustainable and we also expect that uh, going forward. Okay. Um, do you still have, a, uh, on that, uh, do you still have a work capital issue in um, North America in, in laundry? Uh, because there still seem to be obviously uh, some problems, uh, I guess, including inventories. No. In uh, the laundry and home care business in North America, we do not face uh, issues related uh, to networking capital. If you may refer uh, to our logistical issues, everything of that has been solved uh, within uh, already within 2018. So net networking capital-wise, no issues. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Ian Simpson. Please go ahead, Ian. Thank you very much, uh, Carsten. Congratulations on the new role, and uh, thank you for your honesty in outlining the scale of the challenge. It's much appreciated. Um, quick, uh, quick question from me, I guess, which is your guidance is unchanged from December 2019. 
but the macro outlook for this year has changed quite a lot in the last three months, given the impact of COVID-19 on industrial demand, uh, especially in China, but increasingly globally. And now you're setting out a strategy that sounds like it will require further incremental investment to address the challenges you've identified. So how should we think about this unchanged guidance in the context of weaker end markets and a need for more investment? Uh, And just sticking with that investment, with that guidance theme, you talk about your mid-term financial ambition of 2 to 4% organic sales growth uh, and mid-single digit to high single digit EPS growth. Uh, Is that something you hope to start delivering in 2021 uh, or will 2021 also be a sort of transitional investment year and this is more of a medium-term aspiration? Thank you very much. Thank you, Eden, for the question. So, um, the guidance, uh, what we have uh, given uh, today, as you said, is in line uh, with what we uh, have called out in uh, December. And uh, we have called 2020 as a transition year. And uh, within that transition year, all what we said today, what we want to execute in terms of measures, the first actions, is integ- integrated in that. What Marco alluded to, uh, to is for sure the coronavirus the virus is not integrated in that uh, in that guidance so the situation is very hi- uh, highly uncertain and unpredictable so marco alluded to that roughly 100 million what we currently see for the quarter 1 plus minus uh, but uh, so far what we see with this level of uncertainty and unpredictability we are confirming also with that the guidance we just uh, launched today for 2020 The second part of your question, when it comes to what I also said, uh, with the activities, with the change, with the new strategic framework we are doing, our clear point is that with that we will in the midterm confirm what we said already last year, the 2 to 4 percent in organic sales growth, even to the higher end of the corridor, the mid to high single digit EPS and uh, the improvement uh, of our um, cash flow situation, free cash flow a situation, and uh, we will when we will go into that. But we will not, uh, Ian. I hope you understand. Give a guidance today for the year 2021. We have a guidance for the year 2020. Understood. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Richard Taylor from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the for the question. Uh, I suppose I, I want to take a little uh, step back uh, and just understand um, a little bit more about your uh, strategic thinking about the uh, business as a whole. Um, does the, um, how did the discussion go in terms of uh, when he started with a blank sheet of paper, um, do the two businesses, consumer and adhesives, fit together and, and why do they fit together? So uh, that's my first question, please. So, Richard, we believe uh, that the group has an attractive and a balanced portfolio with strong brands and technologies. We have several leading positions in the different categories in the markets worldwide where we are operating, and we offer attractive uh, growth potentials within that. To repeat it, you know, in, uh, in adhesives, the global number one, in laundry and home care, the global number three, even in the active, ma- active markets, a global number two, and in professional uh, retail and beauty, sorry, in professional, a clear number three, and strong uh, positions in color and styling, be it number two or number three. So that's uh, the part you have seen within the framework. We are focusing on one pillar, which is portfolio, portfolio measures, and the portfolio measures announced today, and based the ongoing active portfolio management we will undertake, we will improve the quality of our business units portfolio and their potential to generate profitable growth in attractive market segments, which I pointed out before. And I suppose, again, sort of reflecting bigger picture, uh, it, it seems like the, the business as a whole has got a hangover from pushing margins too far over a long period of time. And that um, in this hangover period, 
Um, we're having to try and make investments to get rid of the headache. Um, but the investments, particularly in consumer, um, there's not a great deal of, es- of evidence that they're working, whether or not that's on M&A or the investments, particularly in the U.S., behind the brat. So I'm just trying to understand why you think more investment is going to get a better result than the investment that has been put in in the past. Richard, we have, a, we have developed and presented today a strategic framework uh, which we believe is the right uh, framework to further build on our businesses and further develop our businesses. And there are these three, uh, these six uh, uh, pillars which I outlined together with Marco before. The changes in portfolio we are undertaking, we need to become a competitive edge in the areas of sustainability, of digital and innovations with significantly more investments. Very clear on that what we want to do. We are reshaping uh, the operating models or have already reshaped them and based on everything is the culture below, the collaborative culture and the empowered people. And with these uh, pillars and with these measures we clearly believe that we can ca- that we can unlock the potential which is related to adhesives, beauty and uh, laundry within the markets and to overcome the situation, what I also described uh, before, yeah, that we overstretched the cost and the margin situation in contrast uh, to the growth agenda which we today have outlined. Okay, and then just maybe one last one. Uh, I don't think you um, disclosed this, but can you just give us a sense in the adhesives business, which has obviously been a strength. Are you actually losing market share in adhesives, please? That's my last question. Thank you. Mm-hmm. To be very short on that, we are not losing market shares. As I uh, outlined before, we have a very clear, a robust uh, portfolio in all the segments uh, which we are in. We are leading in these segments. We are leading in the uh, regions uh, what we're having. And uh, with that, uh, there are no market share losses at this, uh, at this time. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of James Edward Jones from RBC. Please go ahead. This morning, um, two for me, please. First, uh, what sort of buy-in have you had from the Henkel family? I mean, it's clearly quite radical what you're planning to do. What, what uh, indications of support have you had from your, your, your larger shareholder? Uh, and secondly, on, on remuneration, it looks like there have been changes to the drivers of variable remuneration. Uh, what what behaviours is this to encourage? So, James, uh, to your first question uh, related uh, to the Henkel family. So, um, our shareholders committee, as well as our supervisory board, which also consists uh, uh, out of members of the Henkel family share pooling agreement, they are very supportive of the presented strategic framework. Otherwise, I wouldn't, uh, together with Marco, be here today. And and all the changes uh, which we have envisaged, which we believe are the necessary step to make Henkel fit for the future and to deliver on the full aspiration for purposeful growth, are supported and committed. And um, related uh, to your uh, compensation question, uh, can you repeat it again? I didn't hear everything uh, well enough. Yes, it's very simple, really. It it looks like you've changed the variables that are driving uh, your variable compensation. Um, What what behaviors is that meant to encourage and what previous behaviors is that meant to discourage? I don't uh, b- see that this changing behavior, but what we have done, uh, we have put uh, Rosie uh, within the LTI part, uh, especially of the compensation uh, for, the, uh, for the board members. And uh, by that, we want to drive the long-term uh, value creation, and we believe that Rosie is a very good indicator uh, to uh, have that. Yeah, it's very helpful. If, if, if you'll just indulge you for one more as well, you, talk, you talked about greater focus on cash flow. How big is the opportunity there? Your cash conversion's been lower than, than many others in the sector, and, and what specifically, what, how, how will you go about this? Good. Marco, I think that's a question for you. 
So we have been driving cash flow um, quite successfully in the past, and uh, we will continue to do so. So one key driver besides EBITDA that we generate is, of course, the network and capital performance. And you have seen that we are quite at very competitive levels here, uh, and that will remain. No? So we will also take opportunity uh, wherever uh, we have that in that area. But we feel that the level we have now reached, if you look at uh, 2019 numbers, is already on a very competitive competitive level, so that's a band two to three, uh, three to four percent that also we find is a is a very good one. Apart from that, uh, please um, do understand that we do not guide on free cash flow per se. We have a midterm ambition out and uh, that's basically what we can comment on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Namita Santini from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Good morning. I've um, got two questions, please. Uh, the first one, given Church and Dwight's comments in their fourth quarter earnings call of wanting to be the number two supplier of laundry detergent in the U.S. at some point, what can you highlight within your plans which ensures Henkel will not be knocked off the number two spot? And my second question is, um, there seems to be a big drop in organic sales growth performance in the fourth quarter for both Eastern Europe and Africa Middle East. Could you please provide further color on this, and in particular, which divisions contributed to the slowdown? Thank you. So I take the first one, Namima, and uh, Marco will elaborate on uh, the quarter performance or the quarter four performance in the markets uh, you mentioned. So. Coming to your question of North America in laundry and home care. We are not satisfied uh, with the current, uh, current situation. As I explained uh, uh, during uh, the presentation, we have done a detailed uh, review. We identified uh, the areas uh, for change and in mainly asking for what we are changing are uh, in two areas. The first part is strong innovations. I have given some examples on that. The best oxy in the US market with the Persil 4-in-1 disc and really also then behind that to support these innovations with consistent um, investments. That's the one part. And the other part, as outlined uh, by Marco uh, in more detail, the review of our portfolio, which is uh, the 1 billion which he mentioned with roughly 50% uh, being uh, marked for exit or discontinuation. And um, you can assume uh, one third of the business of laundry and home care is coming out of North, uh, uh, of North America. So also here, that region uh, and that, uh, that business has been integrated in that portfolio review. But please understand that I, based on more details, will not give that today in order not uh, to harm the businesses uh, which we're having on that. Marco? Good. So a question on the development, especially in the fourth quarter understood uh, that you have seen overall laundry and home care for the year achieved double digit organic sales growth in the Middle East Africa region and uh, 2019. This was driven by both pricing and volume gains and we were also able to increase market shares in main categories and uh, markets. Uh, towards the end of the year, the pricing component was not as strong as at the beginning so that also led uh, to a different picture that uh, we had towards the end of the year, but overall uh, the year uh, was finished very strongly. Thanks very much. Welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of David Hayes from SG. Please go ahead. Thank you. Morning all. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty of three as, as well if I can. Um, j just on the, the innovation, obviously you're you're talking about the decentralization and the uh, the empowerment of the of the regions and the markets. We, we saw one of your peers, Unilever, go down this route um, over the last few years, and they talked recently about that was um, leading to too much fragmentation of innovation at the center, wasn't really providing enough support to make them differentiate in the market. So the question is, how are you ensuring that you don't have that same issue, that you end up with very fragmented innovation that isn't really benefiting from the scale of the business? Um, the, the second question, I guess, is for Carsten, if I can. Um, you, you talked a lot about the underinvestment in the last few years, and that's what you're catching up on, but, but I guess you were at the table uh, for those discussions over the last few years. Um, can you talk about whether during that time you, you knew and felt that a lot of the decisions were leading to this 
underinvestment and getting behind uh, in competitiveness, or, or whether this is something that's changed, the market's changed so much that it's a retrospective uh, realization. Uh, and then finally, very quickly, just in terms of the mid- medium term guidance of, of uh, two to four, you talked about getting towards the top end. If you were doing around about 4% growth, can you talk about how that would look to you in your budgets or your planning? Is that kind of the DC is doing six and consumer two, or, or would it be that both units are doing around the 4% in the medium term? Thanks so much. Thank you, David. Um, so starting uh, with your innovation uh, question. So there is not uh, a one-fits-all innovation approach uh, which cost, uh, con- consistently produces the desired results. So we uh, will apply and combine various approaches. So firstly, as I pointed out, we are enhancing a faster decision-making and the empowerment of local uh, activities in the region for the region. Marco pointed that out when he was talking about uh, the future-ready operating uh, business models, especially in laundry and home care, to have it more in the region, for the region, and localize that. This is for us an important element uh, of the described changes and um, the operating models in our consumer businesses. And uh, secondly, we're increasing leverage digital tools and the huge amount of data we collect. So we apply agile approaches and incubators to fastly detect the trends, test and learn. Third, we strongly believe um, that in open innovation and idea crowdsourcing that we will also have here opportunities uh, going forward and we will continue We have large R&D and innovation centers at our hand in all three divisions, uh, not not only in Düsseldorf, but also in the regions that we focus here on these parts. And we're still assuring efficiency despite the the regional innovations. So that was your first question. The second one was uh, related uh, to the underinvestment. And, uh, you know, I'm here to present you and what we presented to you is the framework going forward. And I clearly pointed out that by analyzing uh, the areas of change, uh, what we undertook, we have, uh, we came to the conclusion and we analyzed that we did not invest properly enough, especially in laundry and home care in the last couple of years. Yes, and I was at the table as you're pointing out, but uh, Learnings are there to be implemented to the future, and that's the reason why we have uh, defined the framework, uh, the strategic framework we just presented. And with that, we will overcome the topics uh, um, we maybe passed in uh, in the uh, in the past. And then your question was, uh, I think the final one was, how does the composition between um, the uh, two to four percent, or respectively to the higher end uh, of the targets are? We believe that uh, with the two to four percent, first of all, we have ambitious targets out. I pointed out that we are even having a striving to the higher end of that in the midterm, and uh, we are not disclosing uh, today the the details between uh, the divisions. On the other hand, if you look at the markets uh, where we are currently in, the markets are between two to three percent in terms of growth, independent if you look at industry or consumer. And as we uh, defined, um, that is the long-term average of that growth part. And uh, when we define and when we defined the purposeful growth, one element is to outgrow, and that is relevant for all the three divisions we are in. That's great. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Andrew Noel from Bloomberg. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Uh, two, please. Uh, if you could elaborate first on... So you've earmarked 1 billion uh, euros of um, products and categories that I gather they need attention because you've only stated that 500 will be divested or discontinued. So I'm just wondering, what are the options for the other 500 in that 1 billion figure? And if if it's possible to get a little bit, uh, if it's possible to get a little bit of um, color on on what those businesses that you are discontinuing uh, or selling are. Um, And uh, just a second, in in your introductory uh, comments, you did, you, you yourself brought up the theme that there might be a bit of skepticism about appointing an insider um, 
into the CEO role. And I just wondered, what was the feedback um, from investors in terms of, were they looking for an external appointment or, or you know, what kind of, um, what kind of uh, uh, requests were they making on the investor side on that front? And, and does that add to pressure if they were looking for an external appointment there? Thank you. Marco, you start with the portfolio question. So on the portfolio uh, question, you again also elaborated on the one billion that we had identified in our portfolio analysis. And uh, we said that out of that one billion, roughly 50% is what we marked for portfolio actions in terms of divestment or exit. Uh, the, other the other portfolio categories are therefore uh, positions that we put into the turnaround category or into the milk category. Businesses we do not intend or cannot sell because they are closely related, for example, uh, to, uh, to larger brands that we have. Uh, but on uh, the piece where it is about divestment or exit, there's roughly the 50%. And as I also said, I mean, we are working through that. And uh, over time, we will then also take further decisions in terms of scope of these divestments. Uh, uh, basically, uh, the majority of that, uh, as we said, is, uh, is situated in the consumer part of our business. And uh, while we move on, we will give you more color to that. But at the moment, that's what basically we can share. So, your question, Andrew, regarding uh, how did uh, investors uh, talk or uh, gave feedback, three topics uh, I've heard. Do not more of the same, be honest, be transparent, and have more face time uh, to the CEO in terms of uh, discussions. And uh, what we presented today is from my point exactly what you, what I listened and what we do. We have a strategic framework. We have a clear point where we are not doing more of the same, where we're significantly changing, be it on portfolio, be it on how we treat innovation, sustainability and digitalization, different set of operating models and on the base to change the culture and the people, to empower the people and to have a collaborative culture uh, behind. That's uh, why I clearly believe that this is the right uh, strategy or the strategic framework in order to drive the company to the next level. So therefore, what investors said, I believe, is incorporated in that uh, what you have heard today. Oh, okay. And, I mean, maybe, if I could take... And yeah. to add on that, we started today a journey. It's not something, the strategic framework is not something which will be stable over the next couple of years. It is a journey that's the first step. We have also seen at the end of my presentation also first actions uh, to be executed and we will continue the journey on strategic topics to be continued and uh, worked out. Mm -hmm. and, and just on the 1 billion euros, is, it, is, this, is that the, the result of a, a sort of a first look through the portfolio or will there be a, a wider bottom slicing approach over the next few years, if, if that's what we can expect? Yeah, we analyzed our portfolio in uh, different categories, uh, basically, and uh, looked at our ability to win at the attractiveness of markets. and. Uh, basically concentrating on the consumer portfolio, applying the active portfolio management that we also successfully applied in adhesive technologies. And of course, uh, that is something that we also intend uh, on an ongoing basis, not something that has a hard start and a hard stop. That is something that we think we have to do on an ongoing basis uh, to also uh, develop the business healthy for a longer period of time. And please keep in mind... Thanks very much. But keep, please keep in mind, portfolio active portfolio management does not only mean divest or analyze. We also have highlighted that we have uh, M&A as an integral part in our strategy that, as Marco alluded to that, a great balance sheet with really firepower that we will also use to support our three businesses, laundry, beauty, adhesives, going forward. It's a combination of both. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of James Target from Berenberg. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, good morning. Um, 
Yeah, actually, um, Carsten, you just um, your, your your last comment was was my first question. Actually, in terms of you mentioned M and A being uh, you know a, a critical part of your strategy going forward and and the strong balance sheet. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on you know the sort of scale of M and A um, that you would, you would like to do, and particularly if you're you know really out moving into into new segments in, in particularly in the in the consumer business. Um, and then my second question is on is on digitalization or digital strategy. I think you know, this was a material part of your kind of last strategic period when you, you know, increased CapEx by 50% to 3 billion and a large part of that was on digital spend. So I'm just trying to understand, you know, was that spend just too low? Uh, what was the, what, were you spending on the wrong things or uh, you know, was, there, was there problems with execution? I'm just trying to understand, um, you know, what happened to all those investments you were making in digital um, sort of over the last last three or four years? Um, and actually, if I can ask one final one just on um, restructuring, uh, you flagging 250 to 300 this year. I wondered if you could comment where you see restructuring charges being as part of your midterm guidance. Thank you. James, uh, thanks for your questions and uh, good that at least uh, one question uh, I anticipated. So, regarding uh, M&A, um, the situation is not significantly changing compared to that what you have heard us uh, talking uh, in the past. So, M&A is an integral strategy, yes. We differentiate when it comes to adhesives technology. It's more about technological oriented uh, uh, M&A. And when it comes to our consumer businesses, it's strengthening the category, country expertise we are having because this is where we clearly believe you can make uh, the difference. And most probably white spots uh, where we are not uh, currently in the businesses. So that's the overall part. The criteria which we are evaluating when it comes to M&A has not changed. It is about the attractiveness, it is about financial attractiveness, it is about the availability, and it is about the strategic fit. So that's uh, how we see the situation uh, on uh, M&A. CapEx, Marco? You want to do? Yeah, so on uh, CapEx, question was uh, that we, or you commented that we increased uh, by 50% much on digital. Uh, I would like to um, clarify, I mean, the increase in CapEx that we have seen over the last few years, uh, that was uh, contributing to a lot of investments we did into the business, and uh, that was not entirely just on digital projects. What we have done in terms of digital also that led to CapEx was our ERP harmonization project that we have run over the last couple of years. And here also we have seen CapEx coming through that. And uh, as you have seen in the presentation of Carsten in the digital part, and, uh, we are very proud on our digital backbone that we have here uh, that will enable us also to then run the business in a much more digital way in the future. So we worked on that backbone and we are almost complete on that one and uh, that also had a CapEx impact. Uh, for the full year 20, we expect to spend 700 to 800 million of CapEx and also in the medium long term we anticipate the ratio of CapEx to stay roughly between the 3 and 4 percent, what you also basically have seen. On uh, restructuring, that was the other part of your question, and uh, you basically also referred to the 2020 guidance, and we have given that guidance that we come out that year for between 250 to 300 million euros. We will continue to adapt our structures, and you have seen a couple of uh, initiatives uh, we basically uh, anticipated um, in the presentation that we had given today. So that's a range that we see for 2020. Uh, in the midterm, we do not guide uh, on that number, I count on your understanding, but for sure also we will adapt structures wherever we see the need coming from changing market environments or where we see opportunities. And James, maybe uh, to allude again a little bit on the digital question, uh, what I presented when we said one of the key pillars within that strategic framework is also the change within digital. There are two areas. The one area is really to support the digital activities with investments, with new products, to be closer to our consumers and customers using the data, the analytics, uh, and uh, in these kind of areas. And second, to rebuild and reorganize also the way how we do digital in terms of bringing together all our 
um, departments, all our people in terms of digital working in a new way together, which we will, as you have seen from the first steps, uh, which we will do within 2020 as a first step also from the base in order to set up uh, these uh, IT and digital parts to support the businesses better and to be closer to our customers and consumers at the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We now have a question from the line of Ulrika Dawa from Dow Jones. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, you've had a goal of effic annual efficiency gains of more than 500 million from 2020. Um, does it still exist or has it been postponed under the new plans? And the second one, um, also about the portfolio um, restructuring, um, can you give an example of what brand might be might not be surviving under the review? Thank you. So, I take uh, Ulrike. I take the, the second question, which is related uh, to again portfolio. Um, but I please uh, please understand uh, that uh, at that time it is difficult uh, for us uh, to mention concrete examples because you know the businesses are operative, are running and bringing us top line and bottom line and we don't in want to interfere into that. As we said, we have done a thorough analysis, we have made uh, decisions already for parts of that and we will then start the processes to get uh, these uh, parts of the businesses either divested or exited, but uh, I need to uh, ask for your understanding. Marco, you do some, did you so uh, comment on the 500? Okay. So the first question was on uh, the efficiency gains that we had targeted uh, in our last uh, strategic cycle to reach uh, roughly 500 million euros of efficiency gains uh, and uh, that continues to execute efficiently and uh, we are on that ballpark of number so we also reached it and they are well on track so all the measures we had uh, laid out I think beginning of 2016 basically uh, that is uh, what we also executed. I think from this year onward, um, 500 million slower or efficiency gains annually. That's in place. I didn't fully get it. Can you repeat? Uh, because the target was with all the measures to finally come up with a number of uh, 500 million annual efficiency gains as of this year. So does it, you see that, right? Yeah, Ulrike, you know, uh, looking back, I'm uh, together with the new management team. We are in since mm -hmm. 60 days. Uh, you also need to give us a little bit time, and therefore we mm -hmm. don't quantify that uh, at this point. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Celine Panuti from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Um, two questions for me. Um, Digging a bit into beauty, um, and it seems that this is where you have um, uh, seen maybe probably some of the, the brands you want to dispose or discontinue, but excluding those, what kind of uh, growth rate uh, do you see in your beauty business? Uh, because it seems to me that we have seen a slowdown uh, in some of the hair care category, hair coloring, uh, even professional has not really picked up as a uh, market. So where are we going in terms of what is the fundamental opportunity that you see in the beauty care category? And my second question is I would like to come back on the outlook for the year. So um, you are getting for a margin of about 15%, which seems to uh, encompass the 200 million step up in cost that you are getting to for 20 20. At the same time last year, your margin excluding the step-up in cost was uh, very down. So uh, why is it that this year the margin excluding the step-up will be flat? And uh, could you as well, I'm not so sure I understood, so is uh, COVID-19 impact included or not in your guidance? The 100 million, is it included in your guidance? And uh, what should we expect on the margin front or the EBIT front in terms of impact? Thank you. So, Celine, I take uh, your first question and Marco will, come that, will then come back uh, to the second one. So, regarding beauty. Our performance in beauty is clear below the expectations. We are not satisfied and we have clearly pointed that out and we need to change that. We have defined the purposeful ag growth agenda 
And uh, this also relates uh, also for our beauty care business. And by that, give, let me give you some examples on that. So the portfolio part is the first part. We have parts in our portfolio where we had operational issues, such as in the, her in the China retail part last year, which we have solved. There are parts of the business where we have not been growing, also not growing for a long time. This is what we addressed by reshaping our portfolio. And by that, a part or a significant part of the billion we have identified also related to the 50% mark for divestment in continuation is also related to beauty care. The second part is that our innovations have not been strong enough in all meals and we will change that with more impactful innovations and with the increased uh, support we have mentioned today. And I have also shown examples, especially when it comes to sustainability and also digital, where we see clear opportunities to participate in trends, but also in changes of the market in order to grow uh, that. At the end, you are interested in numbers. So for the full year 2020, the guidance is... Uh, out and it is clear, it's 1 to 3 percent OSG, organic sales growth, and for the mid to long term, it's the 2 to 4 percent. And the 2 to 4 percent, when I said to the higher end, is valid uh, for all three businesses. Marco? So, then to your question uh, in terms of margin, uh, why does the margin not go up again uh, after? taking out the 200 uh, million investments. Um, what we have done in uh, the year 2019, we have started to stepping up uh, growth investments and uh, basically that is what is going to persist and we want to step that up uh, further by further 200 million and we need to keep supporting our innovations and brands and we want to do that also in the year 2020. So from that viewpoint, uh, we did also not guide on a lower margin uh, stripping out the 200 uh, in 2020. And uh, if you look at that the current market environment, uh, then also you will see that the industrial environment is highly uncertain. So at the moment, we feel, uh, feel well positioned with that guidance. Yeah, sorry, that wasn't my question. The question was, last year in 2019, excluding the growth investment, your margin went down. So this year, you are guiding excluding the growth investment at flat margin. Mm. My question is, why would margin would even be flat? Why they would not continue to go down? Mm. Uh, we have seen certain developments last year, like also rising transportation costs or distribution warehouse costs that we are not assuming yeah, to, go, to go up further. So all the effects we had basically eroding the margin last year, we do not assume that will continue. And for sure, we have also seen that we have a clear program in place, now what we want to do in 2020 now to also uh, improve the business. And with that, uh, we came to the guidance uh, basically you have seen. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the other third question was basically you were not clear on in how far the coronavirus effects were now included uh, in the guidance we have uh, put out for the full year. And I've elaborated on what we currently see in very, very rough numbers in the first quarter. And uh, that's basically the best knowledge we have at that point in time. And at the moment, nobody knows how long that crisis, let's call it, continues to persist, what the magnitude will be, what the impacts outside of China finally will be. And with the ranges that we also have uh, set up uh, for 2020 in terms of guidance, uh, we do not see the need at that point in time to also revise the guidance we have uh, defined. So the guidance reflects, right. reflects the best knowledge we have at this point. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Fahem Beg from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Good morning, guys. Thank you for the question. I will stick to one. Um, just, just, just a question around the broader use of cash. Um, clearly, you mentioned that M&A um, will be integral going forward, but, but but you'll be focused on high growth markets, high growth categories, etc., where there will be a competition for those assets, and therefore um, the valuation multiple um, for the for the asset might not be might not be favourable. Um, so, in, in in light of that, where do you stand, um, and, and, and also with, with, with other uses of cash with regards to potentially um, increasing the payout ratio, which is probably at the lower end of consumer companies, um, and, and share buybacks, um, w where would you stand on those three uh, uh, potentials? Thank you. So Marco will take that. 
So on the first one, in terms of uh, M&A, we have very clear principles in place that we deploy for M&A projects. There has to be a very clear strategic fit. The targets have to be available for sure. No? And thirdly, they need to be financially attractive. And uh, just a high multiple is not something that doesn't make a target unattractive from a financial perspective. It really depends on the potential the target has and what that means for the financial figures. And we have a very clear process in place and uh, basically uh, we'll respect that and that's how we select the targets. So that won't change to what we have done in the past. Um, in terms of share buyback, that was uh, your other question. We haven't, haven't changed our position to that. We think we have uh, sufficient opportunities to basically invest in the company, and uh, we already elaborated on M&A as one driver of that, and uh, we have not changed our position, so share buyback at that point in time is not an, not an option for us. Dividend? The dividends uh, ratio, and uh, if you see the long-term trend of our dividend evolution, uh, we have increased the ratio also over time. The absolute number has grown substantially, and uh, the current corridor that we have is uh, that we have a dividend payout between 30 and 40 percent, and uh, as you have seen in uh, 2019, we have also moved up within that range. But the range continues to be applied. Thank you. Thank you. Our, uh, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Olaf Storbeck from the Financial Times. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, one is uh, regarded to, uh, it's, it's linked to the 500 million of uh, brand you, you have earmarked as problematic but want to keep. I'm not, it's not quite clear to me what you're supposed to do, going to do with, with, with them. So you said you're going to restructure or milk them. What, what does this milking mean? Basically running it all, them off over time? Could, could you please elaborate um, on, on that? And my second question is related to the 300 million investment program you announced last year. Um, in the press release it says only half of uh, the money was actually spent um, in 2019. Could, could you please elaborate why, why you failed to fully implement this program and, and what does this mean for, uh, the, for this year and where you, where you increase uh, the funds for the investment thing? Thanks. So, for the, for the first question, um, again, the one billion we have, which we um, came from, is the analysis out of the portfolio analysis. We ah. aim with that to rigorously shape the portfolio with a focus on optimizing predominantly our consumer business. Of the around 500 million marked for divestment or discontinuation, the vast majority out of that is brands with our consumer businesses, which uh, has a split between beauty and laundry. And in general, the other 500 million are currently seen as a turnaround in terms of that we need to change them in order to be in line with our strategic framework by supporting our growth agenda. If that doesn't change over time, then they could also become a divestment or discontinue part. And to explain the milk um, part, it's a definition out of portfolio management. So milk means... Uh, on the one side, we can't or we don't want to divest that business, but we, it stays in the portfolio, but maybe not with the same investments uh, uh, patterns uh, as before. And by that, uh, we uh, take profits out of that until the part or the brand is within the portfolio. Olaf, that's uh, for your first uh, question. And the second one, Marco will take over. So why didn't we spend uh, the full amount of the 300 million uh, that we basically uh, announced uh, a year ago? Firstly, key initiatives started only step by step from the end of the first quarter, and we have not been able to catch up this backlog in the remainder of the year, essentially. 
Um, and also, we had to compensate for certain unexpected developments in our markets and the environment, and also, for example, in our Chinese beauty retail business uh, that we faced over the year. And in that respect, uh, in total, we didn't realize the full amount of the 300. Uh, but uh, basically, that is uh, still on our agenda, as explained earlier. And uh, we'll continue, of course, to support the brands in the line with the strategy we just basically outlined. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question we have is from Gianmarco Wero from Main First. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, three questions from my side, please. So the first one is uh, also on the portfolio management on the consumer disposal side. So there's just a question in relation to the dependency between different beauty categories. Uh, is this dependency um, really si sizable or meaningful, or can you then uh, also imagine to probably also dispose whole beauty categories, um, for example, uh, like uh, skincare or uh, or Oral care, for example. Then the second question is uh, just in relation to beauty care in general. How is uh, the negotiation with retailers in Western Europe going on? And um, meaning um, that you have now solved the China issue, do you um, expect no more uh, destocking, therefore, in 2020? And then just uh, the third question is for the midterm. Uh, we got a, a precise organic sales growth guidance and also an EPS guidance. But can you also give us uh, just some sense of uh, in what direction your adjusted EBIT margin could go in the midterm? Thank you. So I take uh, your uh, second and your third question. Marco will then come back uh, to the portfolio part. So your question was related to beauty care, uh, retailer negotiations and, uh, and China. The situation is, uh, you're asking for a beauty care, but the situation between beauty and laundry when it comes to retailers is uh, not very different. We have uh, on the one side, what we have uh, seen over the last couple of years is a quite significant concentration uh, also on the retailer side and the consequence out of that is that it is getting tougher in terms of negotiations and more difficult uh, to, uh, to do the business. To your China question, the China retail business uh, continued to be dilutive also in the fourth quarter as uh, we talked about and expected negatively affected also by decontinued uh, uh, destocking. On the full year basis, uh, we pointed that out, uh, that it has a margin decline of roughly 370 basis points and um, that these developments uh, and to measure our China retail business will also be uh, continued. So the go-to-market approach we have changed and we will expect uh, already positive effects uh, on the start and the quality of the business in this year. The uh, destocking part uh, is, I would say, to 90% over. That was, sorry, that was the beauty. And then uh, you had the question to mid uh, and long term. Um, our guidance for the midterm is very clear. We have a 2 to 4% OSG. We have the high, uh, the mid to high term, uh, mid to high single digit growth expectations when it comes to the EPS and the free cash flow expansion. But we are not guiding on the adjusted EBIT bar, uh, margin on the midterm. We are doing that on a yearly basis. So therefore, I have, uh, you please understand that we will not give you a mid to long term financial ambition on the margin side. Marco? It's on, uh, board. Portfolio management, we basically uh, communicated at that point in time the levels that we see for certain portfolio measures. Uh, all brands, regions or categories are basically included in that review and uh, there is no limitation at that point in time, but also please understand we cannot be more specific at that moment. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Molly Willinsack from Jefferies. Please go ahead. Hi, Carsten. Hi, Marco. Um, you've outlined significant change for the, for the business this morning. You know, you're changing operating models, pushing more responsibilities into the regions. You know, and certainly under the portfolio review, you're going to have some some Hinkle employees out there wondering if they have a you know place in the future uh, Hinkle portfolio. So, how are you supporting your people to focus on on execution while all of this change is you know, is going on around them and and within the organization? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there's a lot of change that we want to drive for sure, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, we stand for open open communication. We basically have a clear plan that we'll outline, and I think uh, the plan is very compelling. And as Carsten pointed out earlier, we also want to tackle a cultural transformation, and uh, with that and the strong team that we have, we are pretty confident that we will get that across. Mm -hmm. So, you asked specifically Marco, so therefore I let Marco first okay. answer, but the answer is very clear. In order to have these, by the, these two topics combined, execution and uh, also concentrating uh, on the current business, it is the leader commi leadership commitment at the core of our heart when it comes to culture and people development. And with leaders who are able to execute that, then we will be able also to have these things in parallel uh, done. And that's the cultural journey which we are starting, which we have started already last year because the leadership commitments have been a part in 2019, but we need to roll them out. That was also one of the measures we have put in terms of what are the first activities we are doing. So culture, collaboration, empowerment, and strong execution. And it starts at the top with Marco, with me and uh, the board colleagues in order to bring that into our organization. And that's what we are standing for. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was our last question. So I will now hand over to Mr. Knobel for his closing remarks. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you uh, for participating. So, I strongly believe in Henkel and I'm totally committed and engaged to shape Henkel's future together with the management team and our employees at Henkel. Today, I've outlined a two-horizon approach towards our mid- to long-term ambition and purposeful growth. So first, 2020 is a transition year to change the way we drive performance, reinvest in the businesses and increase trust. And there is no long-term without the short-term. Second, we strive for purposeful growth with our new strategic framework. With our six strategic pillars, we will create a new momentum. We will build a winning portfolio and we excel in innovation, sustainability and digitalization with future-ready operating models, committed leaders and empowered people. These are the first steps of our purposeful growth agenda. We kickstart our journey and I highlighted our first concrete actions. Of course, we will come back to you within the next steps of our journey in due time. But let me summarize by emphasizing once more. Purposeful growth is not just a noble goal. It is an op opportunity for us to outgrow the markets and an obligation to create customer and consumer value, to reinforce our leadership in sustainability and to shape a culture that enables our people to grow with a sense of belonging. So we are a great company with fantastic products and a successful future. So thanks for joining us. See you soon. <laughs>